I'm doing the speaking because I have the loudest voice, as so often happens in families. <laughs> if you can't hear me at any point, would you please put your hand up so that I will know uh, that I should speak louder. I can speak louder if I need to. I don't want to blow the people in the first row away, though, if I don't have to. The fun things, of course, are going to be when they do Nuremberger and uh, the river. And I have been left with the serious history of what made Auburndale a, the village that it is, and also the changes that have taken place through the years. Everyone, of course, knows that the biggest change and the most devastating change was in 1962 when the Mass Pike extension came through. Uh, and that took about 30 of Aubindale's houses. It took four or five small businesses. It took the lovely H.H. Richardson Railroad Station. Uh, it took the park and really changed and moved the streets. Some of the streets are in different directions now so that when people, when I first came to Aubindale and people were going over the bridge and were trying to find out whether they were on Auburn or Lexington or uh, Central. Central, I was really confused. It took me a long time to straighten them out. And of course, all of that is the result of the highway coming through. But there have been other more subtle changes that have taken place and that also are changing our village as it has been. And one of it is that the village used to be much more self-sufficient than it is now. Uh, we still have two drugstores, but we no longer have the soda fountains. Uh, when I talk to people about what they used to enjoy when they were young, over and over it was either they went to Key's drugstore for the soda fountain or they went to Dengelmeyer's. Uh, these no longer is a soda fountain. I guess the, you can go and get a pizza, but somehow that has a different <laughs> feeling to it. Uh, we are fortunate. We have a few of the places that have remained. Jerry's Barbershop, I think, has been there for 100 years or close to it. And Jerry still gives haircuts there, although I understand the 10 cent shave and the 25 cent haircut is long gone. Uh, Hadlock's, more or less taken over by Cumberland Farms. At least you can still get newspapers and candy there, so I suppose that does the same thing. But Donovan's drug store, uh, dry goods store uh, is gone. There's no longer a place where you can buy anything of that sort. Uh, there's the uh, things that gone like LeBaron's hardware store. You have to go out of town now uh, if you want to go to a hardware store. And even the West Newton one's gone, so you have to keep going further and further for hardware materials. Uh, there's the uh, Lamonts that used to uh, not only have wonderful meats, but also gave home deliveries for people who had difficulty getting out. Uh, the, the star market may have all the goods, but uh, you don't get the personal attention and the uh, transportation uh, that you once had. And the small stores like uh, Cappadoni's Fruit Store and uh, Leonard's Grocery Store and uh, those kinds of stores have long disappeared. So in a way, we're becoming part of the big markets like the star and, and the uh, Cumberland Farm type of, of organization. And we're losing those small village shows. Some, there used to even be Miss Joy's on Maple Street, uh, where you could get your penny candy and uh, something on this side of town, which uh, now there's nothing in that sense. So I think that the change in the village is only partly, maybe it's all to do with the automobile, but only partly to do with the highway. And it's partly just what's happening in modern times. Uh, all right, if uh, we could start. I, the first one. Uh, this, of course, is the city of Newton. I trust you all recognize that. Uh, but what I wanted to point out especially is the part that Aubindale plays in it. By the way, I stole this out of Barbara Tebow's book. So uh, if Barbara's here, I thank her for it. Uh, the, uh, the very interesting thing that has made Aubindale the type of village it is. Uh, in this part, uh, Lower Falls, there, the river was such that uh, there were falls and they were able to have industry. Up here in Lanark, in Waltham, the same thing was true. So that both of those places developed industry at a fairly early stage. But as you can see, the Charles River in this area uh, 
is quite different. It's what they call the Lake District. Uh, there was much less uh, flow. In fact, at one time, before the dams in Waltham were built in 1815, uh, it was practically, um, it, was, it was small enough so you could ford it at uh, where the bridge is now to go to Weston. And as a result of that, uh, Auburndale was better for recreation than it was for industry, which I think most of us are very pleased about. Uh, also, uh, it's only nine miles from Boston, so it was very useful uh, to, for people who wanted to come out here for recreation. Uh, but obviously, it means that as people moved, they moved from Boston out, and these places became much more populated. And being on the far end of Newton, uh, we were fortunate that we were the last to be developed. Uh, I know you can't read this from where you are, but uh, of course this shows you the railroad track that uh, was the first thing to divide Auburndale in two. Uh, you see uh, Commonwealth Avenue sort of looping around here. Uh, but the thing I particularly want to point out about it is I mentioned when the dam was made in Waltham in 1815, it made the water back up and flooded the pasture land. Uh, Auburndale was at that point all farms, or mostly farms, and uh, it created Ware Coal. Ware Coal had not been there uh, before that. And of course, by creating Ware Coal, it also created the peninsula uh, of Islington. So it uh, physically changed the shape of Auburndale. Another thing that, that Auburndale had that uh, was very interesting was the Esca. Now, Auburndale was always different uh, on the two sides of town. Uh, we, we blame the railroad, we blame the highway, but there was a difference right from the start, even when it was first made. Uh, Newton had broken off from Auburndale in 1688. From Cambridge. Uh, from Cambridge. Uh, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Auburndale had broken, no, Newton didn't break off from Auburndale. Uh, <laughs> broke off from Cambridge in 1688. And at that time, it was really four farms, of which by far the largest was the one owned by William Robinson. Uh, he lived over in the vicinity of Freeman Street. That was where his farmhouse was. And the first divisions that came uh, were really when he began dividing up land uh, to take care of his various sons. Uh, but as I say, this side uh, was much lower land it was more fertile, it was better farmland, it had pasture land. This side was always hilly. Uh, it had the uh, sand and gravel rather than good soil, as any of you who garden on the south side of town well know. Uh, some of you remember when the sand and gravel company were, uh, was, had, trucks were going down Grove Street. Uh, the Esther is a wonderful phenomenon that was brought by the glacier, as many of the hills that you see here are glacial moraines. And the uh, Esther started, oh, somewhere in the vicinity of Woodland Road, uh, went down around Hassel's Pond, uh, across what is now the golf course, and about to Newton Wellesley Hospital. Uh, some of it is left in small patches, uh, but the vast bulk of it was sold to create the sand and gravel to build the mass pipe. So our Esther is what you're now driving over when you go into the city. Uh, I mentioned William Robinson. Uh, the Auburn Street was always a very important street because, as I say, originally it went down to the place where you could ford the river. And uh, when the first bridge was built to take people out to the western part of the state, uh, it was built at that spot. And so Auburn Street was obviously extremely important. And this area went to William Robinson, Jr. Uh, to become uh, his place. And here, at a, in about 1730, uh, this house, uh, which many of you know, uh, right after you come across the LaSalle Bridge on Auburn Street, uh, is the oldest house which Auburndale has. Uh, the house was originally his home. Later, it was sold to uh, the Whittemores, who ran it as a tavern. It was a very important tavern during the Revolution. 
uh, because of course, again, it was on the major route. Or when the stagecoaches went, it was the obvious place to stop, uh, and it uh, was a successful tavern. Then later, it was again sold uh, to become a family home, and uh, it went to the Pige John Pigeon and then to the Bourne family, and it is still, to this day, uh, a home, and one I think that we're very fortunate to have because there are so many Victorian houses in Newton, but not many that go back to the 18th century. Uh, the thing that really changed Auburndale more than any other single event was the coming of the railroad. The railroad uh, was built to go, of course, from Boston to Worcester. At first, it didn't stop in Auburndale, but they uh, were trying to get it to stop, knowing that if you could get a railroad stop, you could bring people out here. Uh, the first Newton to Boston train was the media. Uh, it, was, it burned wood. Uh, it was uh, built in England by Stevenson, who built so many of the uh, British locomotives. And as you can see, uh, it had a freight, open freight car, and it had an open uh, wagon for the commuters. Uh, most days, it had very few commuters. I think it only held about eight. Uh, and uh, they went in great fear and trembling, because the meteor traveled at 18 miles an hour. And that was unheard of speed. And it just frightened the passengers to death. Uh, the the uh, businessmen of Aubendale uh, felt that if they could get it to stop, or uh, actually it was the next train after this that uh, they actually got to stop, uh, it would be a great uh, boom to the town. And the railroad said, well, if you can get four people who will promise to take the train regularly, we will make it a stop. <laughs> uh, this was done, uh, and the uh, a semaphore was placed up on the track so that if anybody wanted to go in, they could pull the chain and put the flag up. And uh, a little open platform was built uh, for people to stand in. Uh, well, they felt that this was, didn't give the people sufficient shelter. So after a short while, they built a railroad station. You can sort of tell that this was once a railroad station if you sort of look at the top of it. Uh, but later, uh, I don't think anybody here is old enough to remember it, but it became Bossom's Market. Uh, now that was, um, I think it was moved, uh, certainly it was moved back, uh, so that it was right where the current library stands. Uh, that facing the same way with Ash Street going down here and Auburn Street over there. Uh, the, uh, in 1881, uh, the famous Robinson Station Bridge. was built. Uh, this was the, he had built Trinity Church, uh, but this was the first railroad station that he had ever built. And so historically, it's a very important station, and, and it's too bad that it's no longer in existence. Uh, the, um, as you can see, there were taxis, bus drawn, uh, uh, to carriages to car pick people up and take them to their destination uh, when they arrived. Uh, there was another line also, the Riverside Line, uh, which ran uh, more or less where the current Green Line runs. Uh, the Riverside Station, I love her hat. Uh, <laughs> the Riverside Station was a busy place for those who commuted into Boston from the, this side of town. Uh, you can see Hillcrest, the house, which I'll show you later, up on the top of the hill here. And from here, there was a uh, uh, several things to uh, go by. Some of you may remember the chicken ladder. Uh, if you came from Central Street Hill and you had to get to the railway station, uh, this was the quickest and easiest way. Looks like it might have been rather bad when the ice was on it, but uh, uh, I, some of you know that better than I. Uh, there was also, of course, a small ping pong line that went down to Newton uh, Lower Falls. They had not wanted the railroad in the first place, and I think afterwards regretted it because it proved to be a boon to this part of the town. I show this uh, picture because I think the 
trains more or less have come full circle. Uh, at, uh, at the beginning, there were four trains a day, and uh, people waited in an open shelter, and they had to flag the train. Uh, 10 years ago, when I started commuting from Auburndale, we waited in an open shelter. Uh, at that time, unless you were going in on the 7 or the 8 o'clock train in the morning, you had to flag the train to a stop without even a semaphore to do it. And uh, there were about the same number of trains that were uh, there that uh, we had before. Fortunately, it's improved a little. Now they do have scheduled stops, and uh, I think there are a few more trains a day. But uh, compared to the, to the 54 trains a day that Avondale had earlier, uh, it's, it's been a great loss. Uh, there was a second uh, impetus to the growth of the town. Uh, the town grew very quickly uh, in uh, about 1847, which is about the time the train came in, when a group of men uh, formed, there were 12 men, formed what they called the North Auburndale Land Company. And there, uh, they bought up a lot of land and they made 84 house lots out of it. This uh, was the beginning of, uh, they were called the boomers, and this was the beginning of the land boom in Auburndale. And the town grew rapidly. From 1850 on, uh, it's incredible how, how fast, after years of being rather static, very few people here, in the, even in the 18th century. Uh, but then, but from the middle of the 19th, uh, from the middle of the 20th century, uh, uh, no, 18th, 19th century, uh, on, it was, uh, the growth was very, very rapid. Uh, there were also men on the uh, south side of town who were buying property. Uh, one of these was Abijah Johnson, who lived in what is now the Nye Park Inn. Uh, and another was uh, the Reverend Charles Pigeon, who was um, near Pigeon Hill, and his good friend, uh, Mr. Partridge. Uh, now, <laughs> the pigeons are the partridges. <laughs> in fact, while I'm, while I'm saying that, I might point out that Mr. Pigeon was extremely influential in the town, and it was decided that in his honor, uh, the town should be named Pigeonville. Uh, the, uh, as it turned out, thanks to Mr. Pigeon, who thought that was an honor he didn't want, uh, we didn't become that. And it was Mr. Pigeon who suggested that instead the town be called Auburndale. He had gone to Harvard, and he had enjoyed the uh, Mount Auburn section of Cambridge very much. He used to walk there uh, when he was a student. And so his first thought was that called this town, and of course he knew Goldsmith's poem, Sweet Auburn, and he thought that was a perfect town name for this lovely town. But then he looked at the hills and the valley uh, set up and he said, but we're really a, co a combination of dales and hills. We should call it Auburndale. And so it became that, it became, which I think sounds much better than Pigeonville. Uh, <laughs> although of course we, Pigeon Hill did, did keep on going. I've been, uh, meanwhile, this is Edward LaSalle, in case you've been wondering who this handsome gentleman is. Um, Edward LaSalle was a Williams College uh, graduate. He taught chemistry there and uh, was very interested in education for women. He had taught for a short while at Mount Holyoke, and he thought that women were every bit as capable of doing college credit work as men. There were very few educators in those days who believed that. Uh, and it was his dream of establishing a school where young women could receive an education that was a real academic uh, challenging program and that would still make them very useful young ladies. But he hadn't decided where he wanted to put this. Now the businessmen of Auburndale were very, in very interested that the school be located in Auburndale. Uh, they said, uh, first of all, you're a short way from Boston. You're only nine or 10 miles from Boston so that uh, it's easy to get out to. We have a train that stops here regularly, uh, something most towns can't offer you. And on top of that, it's one of the most beautiful spots anywhere around. And if you will put your school here, we will take shares in the school and put up the money to establish it. Uh, 
This was Mr. Partridge's home. Now this is in the days before the highway came through and you can see uh, the, uh, this is, is Central Street. Uh, you can see the, all the wonderful parkland that came down to the railroad station uh, from this house. So Mr. Partridge invited him out here and they met, he met with the other men and they talked him into putting the school here. Uh, this is the house as it appears today. All of the parkland in front of it has disappeared. Uh, many of you may know this as Dr. Godfrey's house uh, or perhaps as Dr. Manchester's house. Uh, but this, uh, this is where it is, uh, the way it is today. Uh, when Edwin LaSalle came here, uh, of course he had no home, so he stayed here at the uh, boarding house in town. Now he brought his wife and five children and they all moved in here uh, to this uh, building. And in case you don't recognize that, uh, it's now lost all its wonderful trim and has become the uh, Turtle Lane Playhouse. <laughs> it, it went through uh, a number of changes, of course, between the time it was a boarding house and the time it became the Turtle Lane. Uh, first of all, it uh, became a clubhouse and it was used uh, for meetings. Uh, we could still use a place like that. Uh, secondly, uh, it was, it, uh, many of you may remember it as the place where on Saturday you could go see the silent movies. Uh, Don remembers them as being 25 cents. Somebody told me they were 15 cents at one time. So uh, you could go there and uh, it was a very popular spot. Uh, but when the talkies came in, uh, that ended its, uh, its time as a playhouse. The, uh, there were bowling alleys in the basement, and it really was always used as a sort of community building. Uh, Abijah Johnson built the building for LaSalle, and the school opened in uh, 1851. Unfortunately, two months after the school opened in November, LaSalle uh, became ill with uh, typhoid and he died. He did get to see his dream built, but never really got to see it in operation. Uh, but his brother, Josiah LaSalle, and his half-brother, uh, George Briggs, his uh, step uh, brother in law uh, George Briggs, uh, decided that they would see that his dream was continued. Uh, the name had been, he had named it Avondale Female Seminary, uh, but they changed it in his memory to LaSalle Female Seminary. Uh, later, uh, he, uh, Josiah became the uh, organist in the Congregational Church when it was built and started what was for a long time a very close association between this church and LaSalle. Uh, this is the building that uh, was built. It, it, uh, this, of course, is uh, Woodland Road and uh, Grove Street uh, going up here. Uh, it was the whole school. Uh, that everybody lived there, studied there, uh, and it became uh, uh, beloved by generations of students because many of you probably remember when it was stood on what was then called the Acropolis of America. <laughs> uh, this is some of the students uh, that you can see out in front uh, and give you an idea of how they dressed quite differently from the students we see today. Uh, in later times, the school was enlarged and East Wing was added over here. Uh, the building was raised up another story. Uh, the portico was built out over the uh, driveway and uh, it became the school that you probably remember more than you remember the one I showed you first. Now there was a very important man in town. Uh, his name was C.C. Burr. Uh, this was C.C. Burr's house. Uh, this is Hancock Street. And uh, this is, stands uh, just about where Great Ale Circle is today. The house, of course, is long gone. Uh, but C.C. Burr was very concerned 
uh, because he saw the town growing rapidly, but it, there were no churches in the town. And how can you have a town without a church? And so he got together a group of men, and they established the Congregational Church. Now, the Congregational Church got the start of meeting in about 1850. Uh, it was about 1856 that the current building uh, was built. Um, it cost uh, $12,000, uh, which the men put up. Uh, Mr. Burr himself bought the bell for the, for the tower. Uh, he got it from a church in Boston that was being turned into a theater and therefore no longer needed its bell. Uh, and uh, they were very proud of their new building. But about eight, in the middle of the 1860s, there was a terrible storm. Uh, and the storm blew the steeple over, uh, put the bell through the roof, and uh, really wrecked the church uh, quite seriously. Fortunately, the bell wasn't cracked. I believe it's the same bell that's there now. And uh, was put back up again. But for a long time, the building couldn't be used. Uh, it was at that time, as I mentioned, Josiah LaSalle was the organist of the church, and he arranged that they could meet in the chapel of LaSalle until the building could be repaired and put back into use again. Uh, Mr. Burr was uh, the clerk of the church, the treasurer of the church. Uh, he was really instrumental in it for <coughs> over 50 years, or, or about 50 years. So it was, um, he was a key figure in the development of this. We all think of him with the school, but he was also very, very important in the church. He was an alderman. Uh, he was just one of those men who put his, had his finger in everything that was going on in the village. Uh, this one I show simply because I'm sure that Barbara Thiebaud, when she gives her talk, will tell you much more about architecture. But uh, one of the things that, of course, is so uh, interesting about this church, I showed you the clubhouse and all that lovely decoration that has been removed. It's rather nice that here at the church, we still have uh, the decorative uh, details that make it such a special building. Uh, the first uh, church, uh, the first rec uh, minister of the church uh, was Mr. Clark, the Reverend Clark, who lived up on, I remember when I showed the, the railroad station, I showed you Hillcrest up at the top. Well, this is Hillcrest where he lived. Uh, he was very important. He, because he had a son, well, it was very important because he was in the church, uh, but also he had a son who he adopted. He wasn't really a son, he was really a nephew, but he adopted him and brought him up as a son. And he became uh, the Francis Clark, the father of Christian Endeavor, the youth group that became a major youth group all across America. And, and it all started here in Auburndale. Uh, another very important person in the uh, church was Horatio Parker. Uh, Horatio Parker's father, Charles Parker, was the architect of this church and therefore uh, a, a important in his own right. Uh, but his son, who became a professor of music at Yale, and who uh, was a great composer, uh, lived here in the house. And as far as I know, uh, this is the only house in Auburndale that has a plaque on it. Uh, now, this house is on the corner of Fern Street and... Uh, no. No, but... Hancock and Williston. Hancock and Williston, right. Uh, streets is something I still get mixed up on. Uh, as you can see, this tablet marks the birthplace of Horatio William Parker, uh, September 15th, 18th. 63, and December 18th, 1919, scholar, teacher, composer, friend, donated by the American Institute of Normal Methods, July 26, 1926. Now this uh, American Institute of Normal Methods was a music school which used to meet at LaSalle in the summer. And perhaps some of you uh, even went to it because it was a well-known school. And uh, they put this plaque up. And the, I think it's the only house plaque that, that's in the town. If any of you know of another one, by all means, let me know. <coughs> uh, this is Horatio Parker, uh, so just to give you an idea of what the man looked like. Another important person in the town was Dr. William Alcott. 
Uh, he today wouldn't, be, wouldn't seem as strange as he seemed to the people of his own day uh, because he had a lot of ideas that today uh, we consider very modern. First of all, he was the head of the American Vegetarian Society. He was opposed to the eating of all red meat. Uh, he was the author of over 100 books, most of them on health. Uh, one of his famous bo books was called The House I Live In, and this was a, uh, the human body, of course. Uh, he was against uh, tea and coffee and alcohol. Uh, he felt that uh, people should grow their own vegetables and live in the fresh air and live a healthy life. Uh, he was uh, the uh, cousin of Bronson Alcott, the father of Louisa May Alcott of Little Women fame. Uh, and uh, it's said that Louisa May Alcott used to come to visit here in Auburndale. Uh, this is his home. Uh, this uh, was originally on Woodland Road, uh, but it didn't, uh, it didn't stay there long. Uh, it was moved, and uh, so if you know his house today, uh, it's on Maple Terrace, uh, down at the end next to the uh, tennis courts, and uh, is, uh, has been changed considerably, but it's the same house that used to be uh, right across from the seminary on Woodland Road. In case you don't recognize it, this is the Methodist Church. Uh, it wasn't very long after the Congregationalists had built their church that the Methodists uh, decided that they wanted to have a church also. Uh, the uh, Methodists started meeting about 1860 in Auburndale, uh, and they met in each other's houses. They used to have prayer meetings at each other's houses, but the movement grew so rapidly that it soon became obvious that it wasn't possible to have the meetings in people's homes. Uh, so for a while, they met downtown in the, uh, one of the public meeting rooms. But as soon as they could, uh, they started building their own church. Uh, this was uh, finally finished in 1867. And since uh, at that time, Methodism, American Methodism had been in effect just 100 years uh, in this country, they called it the Centenary Methodist Church. Uh, today, of course, uh, we've come full circle again. The Methodists have united with the Congregational Church to form the United Parish and uh, meet back here in this church. And this building, uh, as you all know, is now a, a housing for the handicapped uh, and the elderly. When this uh, took place, the windows of the Methodist Church were removed and brought here, most of them, to this church. Uh, when I open the curtains uh, after the talk, uh, you'll be able to see the place that was uh, built for, to put in the uh, windows. There are other windows on the side. Uh, but the dove, which was over the altar, was not brought here to the church, but was given in recognition of the services of Dr. Uh, Emerson Sylvester. Uh, in recent years, uh, recently, uh, Arlene, his wife, uh, after his death, presented the dove to the Newton Wellesley Hospital, who, with the help of the friends and patients that Dr. Sylvester had served so faithfully through the years, uh, made up the contribution to build this window. The, the dove is the original. The rest of this is a modern window that it has been put into. And it now is in the Newton Wellesley <laughs> Hospital in the prayer room uh, on the second floor. Anyone can go in. The room is always open for prayer. It's, it's right next to the intensive care uh, because those are the people who need it most. And uh, they, it's been beautifully set up with the uh, light in back of it. And if you haven't seen it, I strongly recommend that you go in the next time you're at Newton Wellesley Hospital and see it. Uh, the, uh, meanwhile, the Episcopalians also uh, felt the need for a church. And so in the 1880s, they began to uh, gather together as a group. Uh, they bought this stone from a church in, in uh, Boston that was being demolished, 
and moved it out here and set up this uh, building where they could hold their services. And then I think it was dedicated around 1892. Uh, unfortunately, as many of you know, uh, in the 1940s, uh, the church was uh, demolished by fire. And uh, so uh, a new church of the Messiah was built. Uh, and that is very similar to the uh, one that they had before. So I didn't give you a modern picture of it. Uh, this is Eliza Walker. Uh, those of you who know the Walker Missionary Home uh, must know about her. Uh, she was a missionary in Turkey. Or her husband was a missionary in Turkey, and she and her four children uh, were there with him uh, when uh, he died in a cholera outbreak. And she came back to Avondale because her father uh, lived right across the street from where she ultimately uh, was to live. And that, that's the one that's on the corner of, of Burn Street. And uh, the, uh, the house was not as big as it is now. Her father built it for herself and four children, but uh, she had so many friends who were missionaries and they kept saying, well, we want our children to get some good schooling. So when they became school aides, they would beg her to take them. And she couldn't say no. And pretty soon she had up to 24 children living with her. Uh, at that point, uh, she realized that she needed to have more room. She just couldn't expand her house anymore. And so uh, she began looking for a new place. At the, and just about that time, her father died. And she decided to take over her father's house and enlarge that so that it could be used as a uh, as a home. Now, this is the this is her father's home, and then it, the additions that were added on. Uh, it was used mainly by missionaries on furlough, uh, but then ultimately uh, this building burned down, and the current building uh, was put up uh, to become a sort of retirement home for missionaries and church people. Uh, today, of course, it has uh, sort of changed a little. They still are living there. Uh, but it has become the uh, Walker Ecumenical uh, Center, and it deals with problems all over the world. As many of you remember, uh, when the Tiananmen uh, Square problems in China came, and this became the center uh, for communication. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, LaSalle Chapel, and I put this in only to show you how important religion was in early Avondale. Uh, entertainment in those days, uh, the whole center of life in those days were either around the family or in the church. And uh, this side of church, which was known uh, by the people as Saints Rest, uh, was uh, at one time had 47 ministers living here, uh, partly because of the missionary home, but also it was a nice place for, mission for uh, ministers to live, and they came out here. Uh, chapel at LaSalle was extremely important. Uh, the girls had to go every single day, and uh, their, their day was planned around it. And I, I'm emphasizing this about religion uh, because uh, it did have a side effect. On one hand, it was wonderful. It meant that we had people who were interested in education. We had people who were interested in this being a lovely town to live in. But there was an other side and an uglier side to it. And that was it also meant there was a tremendous amount of prejudice and bigotry in the town. Uh, this is Louise Imogene Guiney. Uh, she was a um, young girl who came to Aubendale to live. Uh, she was a familiar figure on the Aubendale street. She uh, had uh, St. Bernard dogs, and uh, people used to see her going around with her St. Bernard dogs. And everything was fine. Uh, she lived. Uh, 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 the Hennessy House on, um, Vista. on Vista, uh, but Vista Hill. But uh, she really didn't have enough money for her and her mother to live on. And she, her, her father had been an important general in the Civil War. And so she had some connections uh, through him with the government. And she managed to get the job of postmistress in Aubendale. And the good Protestant women of Aubendale did not like the idea of buying their stamps from an Irish Catholic girl. They uh, decided that they would boycott the post office. The, in those days, the postmistress made her money 
by stamp selling. That was, the, that was her salary, how many, according to the number of stamps she sold. Mm -hmm. And so by refusing to buy stamps, uh, they figured they would soon uh, force her out of the post office. However, the, uh, she had friends in Boston, lots of friends in Boston, because she was a very literate person. And as I say, she was a, a good poet, or, or at least for those, she was sort of sentimental by today's standards, but uh, very popular at the time. And she had good friends, like uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes and uh, uh, the, the Fields, the publishers. Annie Fields was a friend of hers. And uh, when Professor Bates of MIT heard what was happening to her in Avondale, he circulated uh, a letter to all of her friends in Boston saying, can't you do something about this? And they, they did. They all organized. And they all sent to Avondale for their stamps. Uh, they did. They, they managed to not only keep her job, but she made the biggest amount of money that the Avondale Post Office had ever made. It did mean that she had to work 10 or 11 hours a day, though, and her health finally broke down under the strain. Uh, she got a job in the Boston Public Library, and then from there she went to England and ended her days in Oxford, England. She studied in, in the uh, college there, studied in the library there, uh, continued to write essays as well as poems, and uh, is buried in Oxford today. But uh, that is the most flagrant example of bigotry I know of in Avondale. Uh, however, times changed. And uh, up until 1922, uh, the uh, the Catholic population had been part of uh, St. Bernard's parish. Uh, but then they, too, uh, were, were growing very rapidly, and they were to break off and become a, a separate parish. Uh, they had plans to build uh, the church that you see here. And in 1922, the lower part of the church was built and became, the at that point, the place for their worship services. Unfortunately, the Great Depression of 1929 came along just about the time they were ready to add to the church. And of course, that slowed down building everywhere, including the completion of the church. And it wasn't until later that Corpus Christi was able to put up the beautiful edifice that we now have on Ash Street. Uh, as time went on, LaSalle was not doing uh, very well. The Civil War, of course, had wreaked its havoc, and that was followed by a terrible depression in the 1870s. Uh, the school had gone down to about 20 students, and it was in imminent danger of demise when it was bought uh, by Charles C. Bragman. Uh, he bought it, purchased it outright, and he immediately set about to make it a strong institution as it had originally been planned. Uh, he he uh, added, built Carter Hall. Uh, this, was, this part of it was his home. It's very interesting uh, because this part of it, uh, if you take off the pointed part, uh, is a replica of the wind tower, which is in Athens. And as far as this, uh, wind towers are very popular in England. You see them in all the big estates. But you don't very often see them in America. But uh, this it would originally have had a, a, a weather vane on the top and a piece that came down uh, with a pointer in, on the inside. And around the walls, there, it's octagonal, and around the walls in Latin are the names of uh, all the, the different directions, north, east, west, and so forth. And so you can sit inside and know exactly which way the wind is blowing. <laughs> Uh, good thing for college presidents, no. <laughs> uh, after Bragdon was torn down, it was originally attached to the back of Bragdon. After Bragdon uh, was taken down, uh, Carter was left. And of course, many of you now recognize that the uh, hall is being changed and uh, is about to become the Yamawaki Cultural Center. Uh, but I'm very happy to say that the wind tower uh, is still there. So uh, it, it may be uh, a little overpowered now, but uh, I'm, 
I'm glad they kept it because it is a very unique feature. Now, uh, Mr. Bragdon was a man who had traveled widely, uh, been educated abroad. He came from Evanston, Illinois, and he had a lot of ideas about education. Uh, well, I, before I say that, I, he, one of the first things he did was to buy a clock house. I put this in not though so much because of, this is one of the older buildings that they had, but I put this one in because of the trees. Now those are chestnut trees. And they're, when I say chestnut trees, I don't mean horse chestnut trees. I mean these are, are real edible chestnut trees. And the Woodland Road, and, and in fact many parts of Auburndale had beautiful chestnuts uh, in the town, but uh, disease and pollution and various things have gradually uh, destroyed them. And I, if, again, I don't know of any real chestnut trees in town. If any of you know of any, I'll be glad to hear about them. Uh, uh, he was very interested in art and uh, had brought back from Europe uh, busts and, uh, of course, in those days, most painting that girls did was done from copying. You copied great art, you copied plaster busts and so forth. And, uh, but he began to bring back things that were really worth copying. Uh, but one of his innovations, that the school had always been high on art, but one of his innovations was military drill. Uh, he uh, felt that it was good for girls' posture, uh, for their poise, uh, for their discipline. And uh, the whole school was made into a battalion, and this, this battalion was broken up into three companies. Each company had its captain. The captain carried a real saber and had gold epaulets on her sleeves. Uh, I must say that the, the guns which the girls carried were dummies. Uh, they were made of wood. We still have some of those at, uh, around. Uh, the uh, Captain Randlett, who lived up on uh, Central Street Hill, uh, was a West Point man and he was hired to whip the girls into shape, <laughs> and uh, it was said that when they would be seen on the streets of Boston, people would recognize them by their stance and, po and posture uh, and the way they walked. And uh, many people, they were important to Aubendale because uh, in those days it was a very close, it was a small village and there was a very close relationship between the town and the school. And they would put on performances that everybody would come to. They would have parades and, and uh, uh, do their drills uh, for the public uh, to see. In spite of all that was talking about neatness and stance, I just thought you might like to see a dormitory room from those days. Uh, you don't see the rock pictures and the uh, hot dressed men that you see on the walls today, but uh, I don't think the neatness has changed very much. Another innovation which he had was a swimming pool. Now, uh, that was a, or a natatorium, as it, as it was called in those days. This was in the basement of Carter Hall. And uh, it was the first time that an indoor pool had been built in a public building, edifice. This is before Harvard, MIT, any of those schools had put in a swimming pool. Uh, this was one of the earliest. I think a few of people, at least here uh, today, learned to swim in this pool. Uh, some of you may remember Alice Smith, the teacher for many years. In those days, of course, she didn't wear a bikini and sit on the edge. She was in her full outfit and had a long stick. And if you were in danger of drowning, she put the stick out for you. <laughs> that, of course, was eventually cemented over and uh, became uh, a jewelry room. And now is part of the renovation of the Yamawaki Center. I put this in partly because I can't resist it. Uh, this is Blanche Martin. We have other pictures of her in other hats, and they're all equally wonderful. Uh, she was the teacher of elocution, and uh, again, I put her in because she, the town saw a lot of her. She was the one who ran the graduations. She was the one that was always in charge of any public performance that the girls gave. Uh, she taught them to say, I'm young and rich and beautiful, hurrah, hurrah. And they would walk around with several books on their heads to keep their posture and see that they had their chests properly balanced. And then they, she gave them uh, their self-confidence by teaching them they were young and rich and beautiful. She, was a, she actually lived in Waltham, and she was uh, a little bit of a notorious woman because she uh, 
believed in the out of doors, and she built herself an open porch in which she slept summer and winter. And the idea of a woman sleeping out on an open porch summer and winter, uh, people thought proved there was something a little strange about her. But she did like cats. <laughs> Uh, the girls got to visit uh, when, they, when they went to Concord and Lexington. This is part of Bragdon's idea, you see, that they should know their area and recognize the important historical facts. Uh, field trips today are very common, but this was rather a new idea. Uh, they had these barges, they call them, uh, these wagons, and they could pull down the thing that rain, and they would all set off in a procession. And again, that was very obvious to the people when you'd see this procession of horses and wagons going by. Uh, meanwhile, of course, the school was expanding. Uh, you can see the castle, what's called the castle up on the hill. Uh, and uh, here, of course, is Town Hall and the Bragdon. In those days, you could see Boston from the top of Bragdon, and you presumably, uh, I heard, could see 40 towns and cities from the castle up on the hill. I'll tell you more about the castle later. Here it is. Uh, of course, this has now become condominiums. Uh, it still stands. There were actually two castles in Avondale. Uh, there was this castle uh, built for Mr. Haskell, who was one of the owners of the Boston Herald. And there was the other castle, uh, the Pulsifer Castle, which was over on Islington Peninsula. And also, uh, Mr. Pulsifer was part of the Boston Herald. And they um, were both built by the same architect. Uh, the Pulsifer State is now gone. Uh, the gatehouse is still left, and there are a couple of the, the uh, Helps cottages still left, all in this form of architecture. Uh, but uh, the Pulsifer State itself uh, is no longer with us. Now, the uh, both buildings, uh, both men were friends, and both buildings were built by the same uh, man, a uh, man by the name of Ezra Winslow. I hesitate, I mean, I hurry to say very quickly, he has no relation to us in any way, shape, or manner. Uh, he was a, a, a con man. Uh, he ran off with uh, uh, money. He broke a, a couple of banks. Uh, he ran to South America where he married a woman without uh, bothering to divorce the one that he'd left in Auburndale and became a rather notorious character. Uh, the Pulsifer estate itself had been uh, a, a, on a just as both castles, you see, were in ideal spots. One was up on the hill where they could see for miles. The other one was out on the peninsula uh, where the river came at from both sides. Uh, they used to give wonderful garden parties. They would have Japanese lanterns around. They would have music playing. And uh, the, the canoes would, would come to the point there just to, to watch the, the goings on, uh, the wonderful things that were happening at the Pulsifer House. Uh, later, the Pulse of the House was sold. It became, for a while, uh, a boys' school. Uh, and then uh, it became an inn. The inn was rather notorious. Uh, there were strange things that went on while it was an inn. And ultimately, uh, by the time the building burned down, it was already derelict. Now, there had been an attempt to make uh, industry uh, uh, it, although Avondale was never much for industry. This is one of the few attempts to try to get an industry going. This is the, well, the Avondale Watch Factory, uh, started by Mr. Fowles, who lived at Tanglewood on Islington. And he uh, built this in the hopes of creating a $1 watch. Uh, he managed to do a $1 watch, but he unfortunately did it about the same time that Ingersoll came out with its $1 watch. And so uh, he never really could make it as a uh, seller of the Avondale watches. If any of you have an Avondale watch, by the way, we'd love to see one. We've never found one. Uh, but eventually, he changed to uh, thermometers. And uh, they built thermometers for a while. But after about 12 years, the factory closed. This was actually across the river from Avondale. So I suppose it was literally on the western side. But there was a little ferry that went back and forth to bring everyone from Avondale. And uh, when it closed, he lost $250,000. And when you think what money was in those days, that was a considerable fortune that he lost on his watch factory. Uh, the town was growing, and it began needing, uh, of course, uh, various things to make it important. And one was, a, as you can tell from the fires we've had, it needed a fire station. And so this is our uh, first fire brigade. This is company number five, volunteer firemen, of course. 
Uh, a fire hose was built uh, in back of Bossom's Market. I showed you the Bossom's Market before, and in the back, uh, on, is this, uh, back of where the library is now. Uh, this tall tower uh, was built to hang the hoses on to dry. It was the only way, you see, to drop the hoses down, and that's why you have the tall tower on it. Uh, the uh, fire station did be managed. This, this is the, it's called the Flying Squadron. Uh, this is the fire state, the uh, firehouses, the mechanized trucks that they finally had. Uh, Avondale was very proud of these trucks. And as you can see from the way the firemen look there, they're proud to be volunteer firemen. Uh, this gives you uh, a picture, as, well, it tells you. Uh, you can see this is Ash Street. Uh, the old railroad station, of course, is Bison's Market. And you can see the tall tower for the, uh, on the thing on Auburn Street in the background. Another major thing that happened then was in the 1890s when the streetcar came to Auburndale. Uh, this is Commonwealth Avenue, so on the end of Central Street. And uh, the, uh, from Lake Street to uh, Norumbiga, uh, you had these cars coming out for 25 cents. You got a round trip ticket and a uh, ticket to get into Norumbiga Park. Uh, and it uh, really, at, even at those prices, it made a good profit. Uh, because, of course, Norumbiga, I won't get into Norumbiga because that's for next time. But um, it uh, was an important uh, means of assuring that there was plenty of business for the streetcars. Uh, there was also a streetcar line that ran up Lexington Street. It went from Waltham up and, of course, could connect with, you could then connect with the other line to, to get to Norumbiga. Uh, this uh, is the old plumber building. It's still there, except, of course, the top part here is no longer there. This has been removed, but you recognize the rest of it. This was Thorn's Drive Store. Uh, the post, old post office was down here. I'm trying to hurry up a little late. Don't want to keep it too late. Uh, this is the Taylor Block, not looking so terribly different from the way it looks today, except that there's nothing beyond it here. Uh, this is the bubbler that the town used to have. I'm sorry they don't have a bubbler anymore. I always liked bubblers, but <laughs> anyway, they had it there. And uh, of course, this is what's now uh, the drugstore. Uh, this handsome building uh, is, was uh, Gammon's uh, Market, or before that, it was called Hoskins. It's the old blacksmith shop was connected with it. Uh, the only thing I really know much about this is the fact that they did sell a kind of molasses that was very popular with the working men, uh, particularly on Friday night, and they always came out a lot happier than they went in. <laughs> uh, here we see uh, Auburn Street, again, Thorn's Drug Store, uh, the post office, uh, Bossom's Market, the fire station. Uh, and again, if you take this off, of course, now with our new bank, it's going to look very different. Uh, go back to Charles C. Burr again. Uh, he was always concerned about education, and education in Auburndale was a problem. They did not have very good schools in those days. And I'm, now I'm back in the 1850s, you understand. Uh, there were a lot of private schools, and most people who could sent their children to these little private schools that were in Auburndale. Uh, but uh, the, the public schools really, uh, both the discipline and the education was of a very inferior quality. And so Burr gave land on Ash Street uh, to build what was the Ash Street School. Uh, even this took a while before it became really uh, satisfactory. Uh, but it finally, they got it whipped into shape and uh, the Burr School was put up uh, in name for Charles C. Burr uh, because he had done so much to improve education in the town. Uh, the, these are the, uh, uh, the students. Uh, I think you can maybe get that a little better. Um, th this is uh, yeah. no, the class is... Um, uh, the Burr School. No, her name. Betty Gallagher. Yeah, this is Betty Gallagher's class. Uh, so if you know Betty Gallagher, maybe you can find this. Uh, she gave me this. She gave me a, a whole group of pictures, and I had to select one, and I changed two or three times. 
But I left this one because it was outdoors and it showed the background. I believe that house is still there. And this, of course, is where the playground is over in here. And not the playground, but the ball field. And uh, this is uh, on Commonwealth Avenue. Uh, shows the students of the day. Maybe you can pick out Betty there. I'm not sure which is Betty. Is Betty here? Yeah. I'm not sure I am either. <laughs> you think what? That was a couple years ago. Oh. <laughs> I'm not find it. They're awfully cute anyway. <laughs> no, please do. If you don't know Betty Gallagher, this is she. because this was his class. <laughs> this is the fourth grade at the Williams School in 1921. And Mrs. Fisk's class, some people here may remember. I, uh, I'm a happy face boy here. <laughs> But I'm delighted to see here today, sitting in the front row, Astrid Nelson, who is right here. <laughs> I had hoped to have a picture that showed Thelma Bailey. But Thelma, if you find yourself here, you're better than I am. I can't find her. Yeah, she's here, but we can't find her up here. Yeah, she's here, but <laughs> I think she cut school that day. This is Tom Lyons, who was always president of the class in whatever class he was in. This is Ruth Layton, whose father was principal of the Williams and the Burr School. And of course, Layton Street was named for her father. This is Dudley Braithwaite. He and I were always the two smallest in the class all through grade school. Uh, Somebody Brooks, she said. Is, here is Kimball Alfred who later, as a photographer, took many of the slides that we are showing today. Uh, somebody asked about Lila Brooks here. I can't name all of them, but I can, I can name some of them. Bill Rennick? Bill Rennick? Yes, somewhere. Up here? Robert Crane. Robert Crane, Crane. Yeah. Crane. Yeah. Crane. John, uh, yeah. could you say something about the presence of African Americans in the group? Yes. Uh, two, this is Grace Houston. This is Ellsworth Evans, who was one of the uh, most comedic characters in our class all the way through. We all loved him. The other two, I don't know. They were there only that year, I believe. Joiners. They may have been. Joiners. Joiners. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, but Ellsworth and Grace were through most of the grades, all through uh, <laughs> six years at the Burr School. And two years, at, uh, I mean, two years at the Burr School and six years at the Williams School. Do you know where they were living? Uh, in uh, in Auburndale, on the uh, off Auburn Street, probably Crescent Street, somewhere in that area. So near the, other, the near the church, isn't it? Near the uh, near the um, Myrtle Street. Church. Myrtle Street Here Church. Is Elizabeth Henrich. Yeah. Oh. Mary, Mary Lee next to her. Mary Lee. Oh, Mary Reed. Mary Lee here. Mary. Ruth Frank is at the end. And this is uh, Mel Lee. And Ruth Frank is at the end. Ruth Frank at the end. Ruth Frank. Yeah. Billy Ruth Frank. Billy. 
Somebody, somebody's doing well here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should take these names down afterwards yeah. and get some of these. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry we don't have Thelma, but uh, next time we'll do better. <laughs> um, meanwhile, uh, this is Guy Winslow, Don's father, uh, who uh, had acted as uh, assistant principal under uh, Charles Bragdon uh, and taught uh, was it chemistry? Science. Science, anyway. And uh, after Bragdon left, he took, uh, bought the school and uh, try, uh, continued the liberal arts aspect of things, but also added new programs, uh, particularly in, you know, as times change, you, you have to change to keep up with it. Uh, the Winslow family. I uh, lived here in Carrington House, which, is, which still stands there on Woodland Road, uh, now a dormitory. Uh, in those days, in fact, it also was a dormitory uh, for the senior girls. Uh, but as the Winslow family grew, uh, the more and more senior girls were pushed out. And so ultimately, it became just the Winslow home. Uh, one of the things which uh, Guy Winslow added to the school uh, was the uh, Woodland Park Hotel. Now, in the 1880s, uh, Mr. Pulsifer and Mr. Haskell and a couple of other men uh, got together and decided that they would put up a hotel for the people of Boston who were looking for a place to come for the summer vacations. Uh, this was at the period of time when they were building Back Bay. And at that point, Back Bay was still tidal. They had not yet uh, built the dam at the end of the Charles. And the Sewers all just ran into the Charles River, and when the tide went out, uh, so did the people. <laughs> they, uh, they were looking for a place that was near Boston so that the men could go to work, uh, and, but their wives and children could enjoy being out here. And so the Woodland Park Hotel became a very important hotel. It was run by a man named Mr. Lee, uh, and it was, uh, used by a lot of important people. Uh, whenever the Yale team came up to play Harvard, the Yale team always stayed here at Woodland Park. Uh, President Taft uh, stayed at Woodland Park Hotel. Uh, the, the list of names of people who came here uh, sounds like a who's who collection. Uh, but right after the uh, hotel came to an end and, and was purchased by uh, Guy Winslow, uh, it was about to open when a flu epidemic came, the terrible 1918 flu. And the Newton Wellesley Hospital uh, soon was overflowing with people, and they had to have an annex, and the, the Red Cross uh, took over the hotel to become an annex of the Newton Wellesley Hospital. Uh, there were 26 people who died in this hotel, not, not from a lack of care, but because the flu, of course, uh, did that. To, it killed more people than the war had. <coughs> and so it wasn't uh, until later uh, that the hotel could actually be uh, opened as a school, and it became uh, LaSalle's junior school. It was an uh, elementary school uh, for, the, for young people. And uh, Don has a sister who went to LaSalle for 14 years. From the t uh, I guess more than that, because I, th she, I think she started in nursery school and went right through the first two years of college there, so she uh, really is part of the place. Uh, this was a beautiful building. Uh, some of you may remember seeing it uh, as you went along Washington Street. Uh, it had a wonderful front entrance and front uh, living room, so that uh, uh, one, of, one of the girls was saying she remembered when her girlfriend rode a horse right up the front, front uh, hall here. Uh, but it's, uh, it for a long time was very well known, but it, it, it again uh, became, to, uh, the foundations were going and it uh, was too difficult to repair, so the building was taken <coughs> down and now there are all houses on this part uh, uh, of Washington Street. It's all been broken up into house lots. Uh, I want to just speak, uh, I'm really getting to the end, uh, but I want to speak a little bit about entertainment in Auburndale, other than Norm Bega. Uh, one of the uh, things was tennis, and I, I chose women instead of men because somehow the idea of playing tennis in their outfits uh, with these long skirts and so forth 
uh, I just find uh, incredible. Uh, of course, outdoor sports were very popular around here. Uh, skating was a major thing. I, when, I, when you talk to people about what did you most enjoy growing up, well, the two things I got over and over was skating on where's Cove, which you still, of course, find people doing, and also on this side of town, skating on Haskell Pond. Now, Haskell Pond is a lot smaller than it used to be uh, because both its size and shape were changed after the gravel and was removed for the, for the highway. But in the old days, it was a great place for the neighborhood to skate. Uh, also, of course, without many cars, uh, sledding was a great thing to do, and people uh, could slide down Maple Street, uh, the whole length of Maple Street. They also would come down, I understand you could come from uh, the top of Central Street Hill, down Central Street, across the bridge, and down almost to the Western Bridge. <laughs> Uh, they used to have, they used to have horses at the bottom uh, to to carry the girls back up to the top of the hill again. <laughs> yes. Oh, you can go up the uh, chicken ladder. Oh yes, of course. You must have done that. Uh, I put this in because many of you may remember uh, the old um, the crow's nest. Uh, in those days, the crow's nest literally was up in a tree. Uh, one by one, all the trees have blown down, and so now it, of course, is uh, just a sad remnant of its former self as it sits on the ground and is more used for vandalism than anything else. Really? Uh, horseback riding was always popular, both in the winter with sleighs and, uh, of course, by carriage, horse and carriage, and uh, also uh, horseback riding, and LaSalle used to keep a stable of horses at that time. Uh, the river, I'm not getting into the river particularly, except to say that uh, after the uh, Pulsiver Estate was no longer uh, an estate, but before the houses were built up on it, uh, this was the favorite spot for watching uh, the, the canoe races on the river. And they used to have what they call walk canoes, uh, which held uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine girls. Uh, and racing was a very serious thing. It was not the kind of casual affair that it is now. It was taken extremely seriously. Uh, this is just the river today. Uh, the canoeing still goes on. Uh, but you can see that uh, the days when you could walk across from one side of the river to the other, uh, just from one canoe to the next, uh, has long gone. Uh, I want to end uh, with just showing you that although Auburndale may have lost some of its village feeling, we still are very fortunate uh, that, that it is a very, very lovely village. And uh, every time you walk down Melrose Street at this time of year, and see this tree, uh, it must make you feel that uh, in spite of changes, Avondale remains a very special place. Thank you. Thank you.